Hi friends, it's Annie Grace and I am answering your questions. I am the author of This Naked Mind. I am trying to answer these questions in all sorts of strange places now that my kids are out of school and uh, my schedule is a little bit wonky. But anyway, today's question is from Lucy and she says, Hi Annie, I've been watching your videos and finding lots of comfort in them. I have a question. What do you do when you miss the feeling of euphoria, the high from drinking? As much as I drink to relax, an even bigger part of me drinks for the buzz and the high. How do you deal with missing that? Or is it just me and does no one else miss it? Well, no, Lucy, it's definitely not just you. Um, I think that that's a huge reason that a lot of us drink is sort of the, you know, the letting go of everything. The idea that in a bottle you can find complete kind of joy and relaxation and just you know a different mind state than you were a few minutes ago and that kind of is encapsulated in the high so my advice based on my journey is kind of a few fold first I would say next time you drink and you experience this high pay really close attention to it okay so pay close attention to how quickly you start to feel it notice if it's before, if a lot of it is the anticipation of having that drink. Like for me, I really started to feel really good and happy and even giddy, like when I was pouring the wine or getting it out of the cupboard, which was hugely eye-opening for me. Because what you want to determine here is how much of it is the real true high from drinking and how much of it is just kind of a placebo and a mental thing and a mental um, relief that you're getting from doing something that you want to be doing and that you're anticipating because a huge amount of the human experience when it comes to happiness is anticipation you know when we've done that with drinking and we almost trick ourselves a little bit into uh, anticipating something wanting something and then the relief of getting what we want or the experience of getting what we want can can really play into that I'm not saying that it's completely because obviously there's definitely a high from drinking but that is a big part of it, at least for me. So just be really conscious of how that feeling comes, how quickly it comes, when it comes, and especially how quickly it goes. Because what I did is I actually measured it and I said, okay, I'm going to drink a glass of wine and like how long does it, do I feel that kind of like initial rush? It was 20 minutes, 20 minutes, and it was gone. And then I was having to drink the second glass of wine in order to continue to feel that. And the worst part about it was that that next glass of wine never got me back to that initial buzz. It would never get me back. It was kind of like this chasing thing. And alcohol has a ton of sugar and glucose. And so this rush and carbohydrates in your system, you know, that is also a huge contributor to this high feeling. So I'd say become really observant and observant of exactly what's going on when you're drinking. And you might be really surprised. Like I know I was pretty surprised that a lot of the high not only did it go away really fast, but it was actually in anticipation of the drinks rather than, you know, a lot of the actual drinking. The second thing is, I would say, because there is there is a high, but be aware of the fact that it's uh, neurologically, it's an artificial stimulation. So alcohol and every addictive drug that provides this kind of high, it's doing that by artificially stimulating your pleasure center in your brain. So the pleasure circuit that um, provides that sort of euphoric feeling is being artificially stimulated and that's a huge part of what makes these drugs addictive. And uh, what happens is yes, it feels good. It takes you above maybe where you'd normally feel. So if you'd normally feel pretty good about something, alcohol can enhance it. But the thing about it is that the second that alcohol goes into your body, your brain is basically and your body is basically trying its hardest to rid itself of the alcohol and find balance again and maintain homeostasis. And that's because alcohol, you know, it's poison. It has to be diluted even to be ingested. You can't drink ethanol straight. You just can't, it will kill you. And um, so not only does it have to be diluted to be ingested, but it has to be diluted and added to and distilled even to be palatable because at its source, the thing that's giving you that high, it's, it's literally poisonous. So your body and your brain, they're trying to maintain homeostasis and how your brain maintains homeostasis is, is it actually turns down that artificial stimulation. So it says, okay, this artificial stimulation is out of balance. It's out of whack. You've got this high, it's this spike. And your brain actually turns it down. And it turns it down with a chemical called dynorphin. And I totally encourage you to Google dynorphin. 
a really fascinating thing. They call it dopamine's evil cousin. And basically what dynorphin does, it's a natural sedative, it's a natural painkiller, and it turns down that feeling, that euphoria. And that's why early drinking days, I could get that high from just one glass of wine or a half a glass of wine or even just a few sips. You know, later on, when I, when I was done drinking, when I was like ready to quit, um, I mean, I, a bottle and a half of wine, and I still wasn't really feeling that tipsy euphoria because I had built such a tolerance, and that tolerance is in part that dynorphin. And the thing about the dynorphin is that it remains in your body. So alcohol takes up to 10 hours to leave your body, and if you're drinking on a daily basis, that dynorphin takes even longer. So what happens is over time, you actually rob yourself of the ability to experience natural highs. So the things that used to make you feel really good or be really enjoyable, they cease to be so enjoyable. And then you think, oh, alcohol is the only thing that gets me to feeling good. Well, yes, it is because neurologically, you've done that to yourself through drinking over time. So alcohol can actually literally, through the presence of dynorphin and through your body's ability to try to maintain homeostasis and try to rid itself of the toxin, rob yourself of the ability to feel natural pleasure. And that's why, you know, severe um, addicts to alcohol report that nothing else makes them feel good and they, they just need alcohol just to maintain like a balance so yes alcohol takes you up but it drops you much lower than baseline so you were here and you had your pleasures it will take you up but it will drop you lower and over time it takes you less high every single time as you build a tolerance so that's something to be really really aware of and just remember like a high school locker room for instance or giggling with your friends at a sleepover when you were a teenager like you weren't drunk and you did not you were you were super high like those things are just hilarious and fun and you didn't have that dependence that tolerance and really the way to get yourself back into balance is taking a significant break from alcohol to to really feel you know to have the pleasure of start to return and a lot of people who do quit they say you know over the first 30 60 days when they kind of their bodies start to heal they start to experience really amazing highs from everyday life again similar to how they did when they were kids and and that's a really beautiful thing so the last thing I'll say on that part is what goes up must come down and you know that was a big one for me it's like yeah I go up but the coming down it sucks I mean people say you know that after drinking they could feel depressed for two or three days again that's a big part the dynorphin it's other aspects but what goes up it comes down and you know just be aware of that like yeah you might miss the high but what are you sacrificing to get it um, and then I'll also say that, you know, Tommy Rosen, he has this great saying, he says, we were created with the infinite pharmacy within. And that means when you take care of yourself, when you seek things that bring you true pleasure, you have all of these amazing chemicals in your body and all of these amazing hormones that can actually make you feel like phenomenal. So my husband and my kids and I, we just got back from this weekend of bike riding and hiking and we did this Taekwondo Expo, which was like two and a half days of some of the most intense exercise I've ever done at 10,000 feet. And my heart was beating so hard during some of these things. And there was a moment where I was literally like endorphins, like it was a runner's high and it was very intense and pleasurable and amazing. And it was something that, although I think you can probably have that type of runner's high through endorphins, through exercise at any time, I don't remember experiencing things like that when I was constantly drinking. I don't remember experiencing that same sort of euphoria and that same sort of just bliss with life itself when I was drinking because I think that I was, even in those moments, you know, after a run, I remember running, I remember doing marathons and ending the marathon with a beer. Like that was the thing you did at the end of a marathon. And so all of that natural stuff was then overtaken by the artificial stimulation from that beer, which guess what, just made me tired later and kind of grumpy. So there's a huge capacity that your body has and you can see it in children's you know, running around having fun, you can see it in high school locker rooms, to really have these intensely pleasurable experiences based on the, you know, the chemicals, I guess, or hormones that you have inside yourself. Um, and then I, the last thing I'll say on this is, you know, again, back to being really conscious of it, make sure that you're not having sort of what I'd call the scratching the itch syndrome. So, you know, you, 
for example, I use this example, my son and I always go skiing and the end of the day comes and we take off our ski boots and we joke about it and we're like, oh, it's the best part of the day. It's the best part of the day. And I'll tell you what, taking off your ski boots, your tight ski boots after skiing hard all day is a really inc incredibly pleasurable feeling, but it wouldn't be pleasurable if I wasn't wearing tight, uncomfortable ski boots all day long. So how much of that drink is just relieving the craving that you have physically and neurologically and emotionally for the drink. How much of it is, oh, I need a drink. You've been telling yourself that all day. And when you finally get it, when you finally transition into the evening mood or the party mood or whatever it is, there's a huge part of your brain that's just telling you, ah, that's the ticket when how much of that is alcohol. And there's only one way to separate this. And that is by taking a significant 30, 60 day break break pure and do it in a way you have to do it in a way where you're just excited about the health benefits you're excited to experience life you're excited to just see what it's like to live alcohol free you're perhaps not making a commitment to live alcohol free forever which is totally fine you're just like on this experiment of, of getting to know yourself because if you spend 30 days pining for that glass of wine guess what that's like spending 30 days in my uncomfortable ski boots so yes it's going to feel much better to take off those ski boots than it was you know just skiing for a day but if if you spend 30 days kind of you know really free mentally going for it with hope with excitement with okay let me let me see how life is how long has it been since I've drank every day I mean for me I know it was I, I don't even know I mean there are years that I went drinking every single night every day that you know I don't even didn't even know what it was like so giving myself that chance and then saying, okay, well, how high is this glass of wine really making me feel? Again, I did that experiment and it was completely eye-opening because to be honest, there wasn't a lot in it. I remember the room kind of getting blurry. I remember feeling tired. I remember feeling a little bit out of it, but you know, it, it wasn't the high that I thought it was, which was amazingly freeing, a huge amount of freedom. So um, I guess the last thing I'll say is that you know, you can also have this high without alcohol. And I experienced this in my first few months of not drinking. I remember going to social situations and I was so excited and so thrilled about not drinking that I was just, you know, I was waiting for everybody to kind of get to the point where they were starting to laugh and talk and chat because I was already there. I like arrived at the party ready to just have a good time. And, you know, everybody had to take their few drinks to kind of loosen up. But as soon as they did, it was like I was right there with them. And I want to do this experiment. Someday I will find a way to do this experiment where you take an entire bar of people and you give half of them completely non-alcoholic drinks, but tell them it's alcoholic somehow, put something in it that, that tricks them. And, and just see what happens because I promise you that so much of it is just the human camaraderie and the laughter and the being together and the telling the inappropriate jokes and the, you know, doing things. Alcohol gives us permission to act like we acted like we were when we were kids, but we don't need the alcohol. We can do that anyway. We can just have a really good time. So anyway, thank you so much, Lucy, for the question. Thank you, Maggie, for your comment. And um, yeah, you guys, it's been, uh, a really good question because I think there's so much on the other side of it and so many things that can pick you up without letting you back down. So have a great day. Again, this is Annie Grace, author of This Naked Mind.